Okay. Now, I've got to be very careful what I say today because um, um, I did upset a few people on um, Tuesday, but everybody realized why um, I was getting a little bit angry. And the reason why I was getting very angry was because in history, um, it can be very, very biased. Uh, it's usually uh, the victor that writes the history, and it's usually, usually that whole events can disappear um, and a whole people can disappear. And one thing that I'm learning myself is that while I'm teaching on a Wednesday evening, the archaeology and history of Cymru, um, that there's so much of my own land I didn't know myself. And then I'm presenting this and everybody's saying we, we didn't, we didn't actually know that. Um, so I wanted to, in, throughout the, the lecture series that I'm doing now, we're into the third one now, um, I'm trying to bring you er areas of archaeology um, that you didn't know about before. And so we've done Pablo Benito. Uh, lots of people knew about Barris and the Teutonburg Forest, but lots of you didn't know the details, so that, that's good. And then there's this one. Um, I, thought, I thought the disaster of the Spanish Armada, and then I thought, actually, let's do the disaster of the English Armada. And we're not going to use the word fleet because it doesn't seem to mean as much. Um, and we need to start off, um, as Chris mentioned earlier on, in 1588 and with the Spanish Armada, and then in 1589, the English Armada. And in 1588, we've got the Spanish Armada that we are told, if I was talking to anybody now, they would say 150 um, ships sailed out to sea, uh, would put off course, there was a lot of naval fighting, lots of people died and five or six ships returned. Um, actually, lots of that is absolute nonsense. Um, uh, between, between about 28 and um, 32, 35 ships of the Spanish Armada were lost at sea. That leaves an incredible 110 that actually returned. Comparing that with the English Armada, that didn't fare um, very well at all. And I wanted to set the story straight and I wanted to really get into it. And some of the information that I read out today directly to you has actually come from a set of archaeological research. So this, is, this, is, this stuff has come very much from an archaeological point of view, but it's very much um, set against a historical backdrop. So 1588, the Spanish Armada, um, it sort of set sail to invade uh, England. One thing is, is if the uh, Spanish had managed to set um, on the shores of Kent, they would have probably reached London, defeated the English army and said, right, um, we want, don't want any more wars with England, we're gonna go back. And that's exactly, um, it said that Adolf Hitler would have done in the Second World War. Um, so number two is after battles in the English Channel, battles in the English Channel, these weren't really battles in the English Channel. Um, you know, these weren't sort of major battles like Trafalgar. Uh, there they were, they were one or two cannons fired. That was it. Um, very few um, ships on either side were affected. What, what happened was very much um, along the coast of France, uh, and France and uh, Flanders, the, the low country, country. Uh, the land of the Dutch, in other words, the Netherlands. So they, they were trying to bring an army over to England. But that's, again, the Spanish Armada of 1588. Um, and by, by when you get to number three on the chart, it said most of the fleet's losses are the result of shipwrecks off the coast of Ireland. So in other words, most of the losses incurred against the, uh, against the Spanish were caused by um, accidental wrecking along the coast of Ireland. Um, so when people turn around to say there were hundreds of Spanish shipwrecks along the Scot Scottish, Irish and Wales coast, they're talking out of their hat. Um, it's likely that um, there's probably about 20 vessels along the coast of um, Ireland, um, a, a few more in Scotland, maybe one off the coast of, of, of Cymru, Wales, and that's it. Um, it's, not, it's not a major treasure trove of ships. And these are, not, um, these are not the great galleons that we're talking about. These are large um, armed merchantmen, which is a big difference. And then what we then, then what we turn then is we start to um, think, I started to think, you know, naively, um, the, the Spanish Armada 
um, obviously the 28 to 32, 35 Spanish ships that went down. Um, and I then thought, um, we've got a few of those wrecks that have been found. The English Armada, we're going to find, um, you know, some of those 50 ships as well. You know, obviously you can see the difference in figures. There were a few more English ships lost than Spanish ships um, with the return visit that following year um, in 1589. And the, the terrible thing that I was finding in my research was that I couldn't find any archaeology of those English ships that went down associated with the English Armada. And there's very little research being done on them. So when you talk about um, Spanish doubloons and um, Portuguese doubloons being washed up on the shores of Wales and Cornwall and Ireland in the bucket loads, um, whether that's true or not, I very much doubt it. Um, and then I start to think, what about um, coins of um, Elizabeth the First Father and uh, Mary and Elizabeth being washed up on the shores of France, um, La Rochelle and um, La, La Corona um, in Spain and Portugal. What about those kinds being washed up on shore? If they have, nobody's been really recording them. So before we even start, the history is really biased. It's a really bent and twisted history in regards to these two events. Um, this cannon is a Spanish cannon off the coast of um, Ireland. And whenever you think about the true story with, the, with these two Amadas, Every, everybody always tells the story about the Spanish Armada. Everybody always talks about the following. So here we go. Here's me in school um, when I was um, 13 years old. Right, right, people. Um, this is a teacher talking. The Spanish Armada, we completely defeated it at sea. Um, we caused many wrecks, wrecks off the British coastline. Um, tens of thousands of lives were lost. And it's a brilliant event in British history. It unifies our land and it shows how wonderful a Queen Elizabeth I is. Nobody actually talks about the true tragedy of the loss of life. Nobody talks about that. Where, where's, the loss, where's the sentiment for those sailors that were lost at sea on the Spanish side? So you know what? I'm going to give no sentiment to those English sailors that were lost as part of the English Armada. This is where I rewrite history. This is where I change those history books from school into something else. Um, so, but I'm gonna try, even with that, to try and be a bit more balanced. So this vessel could be any vessel. This could be um, a Spanish vessel um, smashed along the coast of Ireland, or this could be an English vessel smashed along the shore of Portugal. And these coins, these doubloons, the silver, um, technically gold doubloons, but we'll call these the silver doubloons here. Um, all, all, these, all these sort of uh, assemblages of gold and silver that we know associated with the Spanish Armada. Again, we're lacking that archaeology on the ground associated with the English Armada. And don't come back at me and say that there was no English Armada because we can't find the archaeological evidence. Don't wind me up. But the fact of the matter is, these two events did happen. Um, and in the last statement I make today really pads out the true level of the bias of history. And one thing we're going to do next week is that we're going to do the fall of the Roman Empire um, in two parts. We're going to do it looking at Britain and we're going to do it looking at Rome itself. Um, and that's very the biased side of history as well. If you believe the historians, all the Romans left Britain. Um, and they left us um, hanging in the wind um, like little bits of flotsam out at sea in the year 410. And we were completely vulnerable and silly little uh, people. But that's the historians. The archaeology tells us something totally different. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to re-level re the history. So th this, this is um, a load of timber from um, a Spanish wreck, again, off the Irish coast. Don't have any comparable um, comparable evidence of the coast of Portugal, Portugal in regard to those ships that were lost um, from the um, English um, Armada. And what I'd like to do is start off with this introduction. Between July 1588, when the Spanish Armada, the so-called Invincible Armada, set sail from Spain, and then July 1589, when the remnants 
of its English counterpart, the little known English Armada, there it is in black and white, Andrea, returned to England, there occurred two of the greatest naval catastrophes in history. Now that's not, that's not biased, that's fact. Since the time of the Spanish Armada until the present day, much attention has been paid to this event, the event of the Spanish Armada. And over time, it has become one of the defining moments in the history of Europe. However, no attention. And for the rest of you, no attention has ever been paid in your lives towards the English Armada. Or rather, the attention that has been given to it has been to conceal it. And as a result, it has completely disappeared from history. It never happened. Yet remarkably, the English disaster of 1589 was greater than the Spanish. I will reread this from a senior academic. English disaster of 1589 was greater than the Spanish, one that took place the year before. Such a puzzling situation, is it, isn't it? leads us to consider the nature of such defining moments in history. The lies, the distortion, the cover-ups. How do they happen? How do they develop? What is their purpose? And especially, how is it possible that two such similar episodes have received such unequal treatment? And then we go back again. We go back a page. Let me do this. Talks, this bit talks about the Spanish Armada, which you all know about but we're gonna do it. The attention paid to the defeat of the Spanish Armada was entirely commensurate with the fear that was generated in England. And can I just say, if I'm critical of the English, I'm actually critical of myself, because at that point, Wales was England. Whether you like it or not, Wales was a province, became a province of England in 1536. Look up your history. So, I'm having a go at myself as well. Generated in England by the threat of a substantial invasion by the leading power of the age. This, this threat came not only from the sizable army that the Spanish was transporting, but also because it was under orders to escort the Turquillo, regiments from Flanders, experienced Spanish, Portuguese and Lowlander soldiers, to Kent. If that operation had been successful, there would have been little that Queen Elizabeth could have done on land to avoid defeat. Her army would have just fizzled out. It would have been of no match for this well-trained army. Philip II had no imperialist ambitions to conquer and annex, in, in, to annex England. His intentions were to defeat Elizabeth and put an end to a zealous and spe specifically anti-Spanish sense of Protestantism. She was not a Catholic like Philip II. His, his aim in deposing Henry VIII's daughter was to end the pirate attacks that she sponsored, to put a stop to the aid she was given to the Dutch, who had rebelled against their legitimate King Philip II, and to ensure religious tolerance for the Catholics. In general terms, there was no such serious or palpable threat to Spain at that time. Um, so he was just doing it to settle a score. So in other words, the other point as well was that 50% of the population of Britain that still believed in Catholicism would have welcomed the Spanish, 50%. Queen Elizabeth may have been popular with William Shakespeare and the playwrights of the time, but she was still a Protestant. She was still a Tudor a Tudor that banned the use of Welsh being spoken in Wales. That is why during the summer of 1588, England concentrated on preventing the much feared landing at all costs. And the landing never happened. The intercepting fleet managed to stop the progress of the operation, which was never likely to be feasible without a deep water port in Flanders to provide the starting point. The effort required of that English fleet was considerable. Basically, the subtext is that the English fleet harried um, the Spanish fleet. It didn't actually, it wasn't face to face. If it had been face to face, the English uh, Navy would have been wiped out where it was wiped out the following year. But afterwards, when Elizabeth pinched herself to make sure she wasn't dreaming and was still on the throne, she was overcome 
by boundless excitement and confidence. That was not surprising. Against all predictions and against the prevailing morale and reputation, she had stopped the all-powerful Philip II in his tracks. However, the triumph was not celebrated with fireworks back in 1588, nor was it celebrated in 1589 by many. Instead, England set on a, prop, a substantial propaganda campaign, and together with the rest of the Protestant world, it was flooded with pamphlets, popular songs, poems, engravings, paintings, coins, medals, and so on. It wasn't so much about the Spanish Armada, it was about more about how wonderful our Queen is. In September, the Queen's advisor, Lord Burley, published a pamphlet which ended with, so ends this account of the misfortunes of the Spanish Armada which they used to call invincible. Burley highlighted the word by putting it in capital letters, but it was an invention that no Spaniard would have used to refer to the Spanish Armada. Translations into French, German, Dutch, and Italian appeared, immediately appeared, ridiculing the term invincible Armada, and how wonderful Queen, Queen Elizabeth I was back then. Thus Burley won a lasting propaganda coup they had told the event very differently than actually what happened. This is what this is saying. For his part, Charles Howard, first Earl of Nottingham, commissioned a series of tapestries representing a great all out naval battle fought at close quarters, absolute balderdash. But the Spanish Armada was neither called invincible nor was it involved in the battle. This was a fictitious battle, it never occurred. The impact of Howard's propaganda victory lasted as long as Burley. The great body of propaganda created an alternative reality, which over the centuries turned into the defeat of the invincible Armada, the great defining moment of English nationalism with its litany of related cliches and invented history. This, this, it didn't say anything about the sailors dying of scurvy. It didn't say about the thousands and thousands of English sailors who were dying on board ship, trying to chase the Spanish Armada. It didn't say any of that. It, it, was, it was a momentous propaganda coup. So what we're gonna do now, <clears throat> we're gonna look at this. Um, this, this is that story about the, sp uh, the fire ships um, that are sailing against um, the Spanish Armada fleet. Now, albeit that few ships were actually lost, um, illustrations like this are completely fictitious and, and they're completely complete lies. Um, very few Spanish ships were lost due to an English fire ship. That's another thing where it's been overemphasized. Um, and, you know, it's sort of showing the wonderful disaster and loss of life on the Spanish side. Let's celebrate the loss of, loss of life. Let's celebrate these Catholics being drowned this, this, is, this is what this history is about. It's a very evil and distorted, toxic history. And we've all had to put up with it in school. Do you know, last week when I, when I, was, um, when I was teaching the class, there were several people, and I'm not making this up, several people said that, you know, we were taught lies in school. None of what I was saying last night, they had been told in school. And one of you said that, who was with, who was with us today. Um, so here's some of the facts and figures, okay? Um, what I'm going to try and do is, um, if, if those of you have got a pen, right, write some of these facts and figures down. So um, I'm, I'm actually going to try something else. I'm going to try if I can get these back to back. Hang on a minute. I'm just going to see if I can get these two back to back. If it goes um, um, up the creek, then I know what's happened. Um, right, so here we go. I'm hoping that I can get this um, and I know I've got nobody with me at this minute so I'm just going to try and move this over move this a bit Hang on. technology um, get rid of that um, I'm hoping that you can see these two alongside each other so if I stop sharing and I come back up and then I can possibly um, it's not it's not coming up is it nope I'm not getting it no 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 well, okay. Then. Well, um, I've got these. I've got these two two things alongside each other, so I'm going to have to do it this way. Um, so, right. So, what we've got in um, the the Spanish Armada of um, the previous year. Hang on. Hang on. 
my technology is not working. A minute. Right, the, the Spanish Armada of the previous year, July to August 1588, it said that the Spanish had um, 22 galleons. So that's 22 galleons. Um, this is part of the Spanish Armada in 1588. It also had 108 merchantmen. And it had probably about another 20 odd vessels, um, various galleys, various other small vessels, um, probably with a total um, naval, um, probably a total force in soldiers of, um, of somewhere around um, 25,000 soldiers. But it's likely that some of, some of them never ever got on board ship. So we're not exactly sure. Um, the true figure is more like about 20,000 actually. So that's about 20,000 in total for the sake of mathematics that's 150 vessels. And that faced, this is another thing, in 1588 that faced on the English side near over 200 vessels, right? Over 200 vessels in the Royal Navy. So for, for one thing the Spanish Armada is not bigger than the English Navy. In fact the English Navy that's that that side of things is actually much bigger than the, than the Spanish Armada. And if you want to do the quick mathematics there, it says 163 armed merchant ships, about 34 um, galleons, large vessels. So that's 197 plus another 30 odd vessels. So that is in total with using these um, facts. Um, 120, uh, 227 vessels versus a very much smaller Spanish Armada. Um, and we're not sure of the figures of dead, but there's um, what we do see on the Spanish side is between 28 and 35 vessels lost. Okay. And the figures there are more like 15,000 men lost altogether, probably a lot less than that. I'm going away from those figures. Uh, because of some of my other research. Now that comparing, hopefully you can all see this. Uh, I'm going to check my screen a minute and I'm hoping that I, I'm showing you the right thing. Um, here we go. Um, and that, if you want to compare uh, with the following Armada. So we've already done the Spanish Armada. So if anyone wants to have these facts. Now this is the English Armada. This is the following year. This is the return visit in 1589. Okay, the, um, the English Navy has um, 60 um, armed merchantmen, okay, and six large galleons, plus 60 Dutch flyboats, and we'll talk about what these vessels look like, and plus another 20 pinnacles, which are very much smaller types of galleons. So if you want to do the maths on that, that's 146 vessels in total with, with somewhere in the region of about 20,000 men and the losses of 15,000 men are between 40 and 50 ships. So that is more losses than the previous year's Spanish Armada. And guess how many ships the Spanish Armada had at that stage because all the other vessels were being refitted. For 146 vessels of the English Navy faced off four galleons and about 15 other Spanish ships. And I tell you what, it goes to show what an absolute crap Navy the English Navy was back in 1589. It wasn't the wonderful Navy that um, historians tell us. Um, it was a very poorly trained Navy. Um, it had incredible losses. And if you ever read books where it says in history that the English Navy's never been defeated, it was defeated categorically um, by the Spanish Navy in 1589. I'm only, um, only leveling out the history that you've been told at school. But with my bravado and with my biased sounding tongue today, um, let's actually get into the, some more of these facts. So this is what um, a typical galleon would have looked like in the early part of the 1600s. So what's missing from this vessel is a castle on the prow and aft, basically a raised turret um, on the prow and um, a more of a raised turret on the aft where the cabin would be later on. So this is what a galleon looked like on both sides. 
And that's what we're talking about. This is more of what we're talking about. This is more of what's being washed up on the shore of an island associated with the Spanish Armada. But naturally, there, there was a number of these um, with the Armada the following, following year. And when it says six galleons, Lots of those armed merchant vessels are very, uh, very big, very big vessels. Um, so what you've got um, with, with the prow and you've got the aft, the, these castles are like the old turret type things. You know, when you when you think about um, the Mary Rose, um, the, these are the types of things that you're actually seeing. And you've got um, several decks, which is the types of vessels that are being developed. And if you go into the sort of um, guts of the vessel, uh, this is something known as a bilge pump. And a bilge pump would be attached to hose. This is a pumping mechanism to take the bilge from the um, lying of the keel at the base of the vessel, which is full of your ballast. The, these are all rocks and barrels and all the rest of it. So that pumps out the bilge. Um, and these vessels would be crammed full of sailors. So you can imagine if one of these vessels went down there'd be a hell of a lot of loss of life. And there was a hell of a lot of loss of life. And the, the, the great tragedy is, with the English Armada, um, is that there was a substantial loss, loss of life through field actions on land. There was a lot of life um, through actions at sea. And there was also a lot of life through disease. Um, probably comparable, if, if you want to say about 15,000 15, men actually lost their lives, um, what, what you need to think about is probably half died through disease. And the terrible thing is, me taking the bias out of all this, the, the, the terrible thing is when those English sailors came back into Plymouth, um, thousands of people died in Plymouth through the various diseases that the sailors had brought on land with them. So that, that's another one of the tragedies. That's more of a human tragedy um, associated with all this. So, um, so a little bit about these galleons. It's usually um, a, a large three or four masted square rigged vessel, multi-decked sailing ship used prim primarily for the nations of Europe, um, Spain, Portugal, and so on, from the 15 to the 1700s. Whether used for war or commerce, galleons were generally lightly armed, even for their time. Now, when I, when I mentioned this, I had somebody in my class on Tuesday saying, oh, well, you know, um, Spanish ships were poorly armed and, um, you know, when they went against the English Navy, the English Navy had more cannons and they sunk more Spanish vessels. That's an absolute lie. Um, and the thing is, uh, the thing is, lots of these Spanish vessels had quite a few cannons on board them. Um, and I think what the point people are trying to say is that the Spanish weren't great gunsmiths out at sea. And that's, that's a lie as well. So what I'm, again, I'm trying to level history. Um, so that's a galleon. And I mentioned, um, this, this is what we're talking about. This is, this is probably a, the, about the vessels that we're talking about from about 1588, 1589. They, 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 the Spanish and the English galleons were, were, looked exactly the same. Um, and, and obviously you can, you can see, see Queen Elizabeth colors on it. Uh, the, these are these are these have got sort of um, fairly uh, deep keels, um, several different le levels. Um, you've got four sails there, um, quite cumbersome, quite brutish ships. And um, these are probably some of the types of vessels that that were coming back with goods um, from uh, the Caribbean, which was something that um, for a San Sir, Fra Sir Francis Drake was actually very much interested in. Uh, uh, so Francis Drake, a complete cowboy, evil, vindictive, pirate bloke, he's no national hero. Um, so what we, what, we then, what we then think about then is that we, we then talk about uh, the armed merchantmen. Now the armed merchantmen on both sides um, look very similar to this. Um, Low-lying, they are merchantmen, they, they are for trade along the coast. Um, ob obviously they can go across the Bay of... Um, Biscay, for example, and the English Channel and the Irish Channel, and but these weren't great sailing vessels to go to the New World, for example. Um, so lots of these armed merchantmen involved in this conflict um, on both sides. Quite a few of these were lost um, on both sides as well. 
Um, and when we actually, then we come to this vessel known as a pinnacle. I mentioned that um, the, the English Navy itself had um, 20 pinnacles. And these, these pinnacles are small, two-masted vessels often used for carrying messages between the larger vessels of the fleet. So these are the ones that would, um, a pinnacle would have gone back to Queen Elizabeth the following year in, in 1589 to actually give her messages and say, you know, um, this, this, is, this, is, this is what's happening, you know, what should we do and so on. So these are the mess, um, messenger vehicles um, of the day. Um, little pinnacles, the, these, are, these are coastal sort of vessels. Um, and that's, um, and the, this is another vessel that, um, I, I don't know if we, we mentioned the fly boats. I, I think we said 60 merchantmen, um, 60 fly boats, 60, six gallon, gallion, six galleons and 20 pinnacles, those 60 fly boats. This is a fly boat. It's, it's a rather interesting vessel. It's also a coastal vessel. So it's no good for going out to deep, deep ocean, for example. It, it would sort of hug along the, kit, um, the coastline. It's a fly boat. Fly, it would fly. Um, the, these were vessels which were very um, popular with the Dutch. And when the Dutch turned against the um, English Navy, the following, um, the following 100 years or so, um, the Dutch were very successful with the fly boats. Now, the Dutch were actually allies uh, with, the, um, with the English Navy in um, 1589 and there were 60 of these vessels um, and as the description gets we, we have um, two, two main masks, broad buttocks, heavy buttocks, so they're not ocean going, they're, they're, they're to, to carry a lot of ballast and it's a lot, lot of stuff in the hold, um, one or two masks, usually two, square rigged um, and a sprit sail um, and they were about 600 tons and mainly used for lo local coastal traffic. So these were the supply vessels um, and these were troop carriers as well. So again, what, what the, there were four, they, start again, there were four aims, three main aims um, of the English Armada. And we, we've, we've actually got to look at some of this now, actually. So here we go. So um, the English Armada, it was going to be... Um, Queen Elizabeth's crowning glory, uh, but it wasn't to be. But then again, she was able to paint over the cracks and this was to be forgotten. And Queen Elizabeth goes into history um, as not the sinister, vindictive um, queen that she actually was. She actually came out of this as being a wonderful queen that had this victory over the Spanish in 1588. Um, the war of um, between 1585 and 1604 ended um, with a stalemate. Um, after both sides losing large numbers of ships out at sea um, and large armies. Um, the interesting thing is, is that um, Francis Drake led, led, led the fleet on his flagship known as the Revenge. Those that are sailors amongst you will know about the name Revenge. It's a, it's a name of a, it's, it's HMS Revenge as, is a ship that's gone through down the ages. There's been 15 different revenges throughout history, all due to the fact that Sir Francis Drake, Drake um, went into battle using this as his flagship in 1589. The Spanish victory marked a revival of Philip II's naval power through the next um, decade in 1589. But Philip II didn't brag and he didn't write pamphlets about this. So, um, so, after the failure of the Spanish Armada, Queen Elizabeth's first intentions was to capitalize on um, Spain's temporary weakness at sea and to compel Philip II to sue for peace. She had three aims. The first aim was to destroy the ships that she hadn't destroyed out at sea that had returned, all 110 of them, um, the following year um, in 1589. She wanted to destroy them in uh, Port Santander on the northern Spanish coast. That's what she wanted to do. And she wanted to use flag, um, she wanted to set alight a number of the um, fly boats um, and into the Spanish fleet. And she wanted to destroy the Spanish fleet. And then the next thing would be to land in Lisbon, Portugal, and raise a revolt there against Philip II. Um, 
who was actually not only king of Spain, he was actually king of Portugal at that time because the Spanish said, uh, the, the um, uh, Portuguese said, we don't have a king anymore, can we have yours? And the English didn't like this. It meant that the Spanish had control not over the Spanish world, but the Portuguese world. But if anyone ever says to you that the English empire was the biggest empire that ever was, that's another lie. Because in, um, 15, um, in 1589, the Portuguese and Spanish empire were in fact the biggest empires that this planet has ever seen. Um, wanted to rewrite that one. And then to continue west and establish a permanent base in the Azores. So what was gonna happen? Just the third aim was to capture the island of the Azores from the um, Spanish um, and to actually make the Azores um, the, the, the base that they ended up like, you know, eventually ended up with Helena. Um, they wanted a base like Helena so they could go back and forth to America, right? But they never captured the Azores either, but they wanted to. That's what, that's what the aim was. So if they could have captured the Azores, they could have stopped the fleets of Spain and Portugal sailing back and forth to the New World. And eventually Queen Elizabeth would have conquered the New World and history would have changed. A, um, a further aim was to seize the fourth aim, not official aim, the fourth aim was the aim of Sir Francis Drake. The further aim was to seize the Spanish treasure fleet as it returned from America to Cadiz, although this depended largely on the success of the Azores campaign. But Sir Francis Drake, um, the murdering pirate as he was, didn't tell Elizabeth I that that was one of his aims. He was the leader of this fleet and he was trusted by Elizabeth I. But then again, she got wind of what was going on the following year. So what was going to happen was that um, uh, we're looking at this and the, the fleet was to sail from Plymouth, probably a few ships from Southampton, all the way into the English um, Channel, fairly, it's not very, very extremely deep water. And then you actually get into this bay, the Bay of Biscay, which is very deep water. Can be, can be very uh, windy, uh, the gales, very stormy. Um, and if you hit the wrong storm, um, your vessel's going to capsize and you're going to lose all hands. This is how dangerous the Bay of Biscay was. So what needed to happen uh, was that um, what needed to happen was to hug along the coast all the way down through La Rochelle, then basically a little bit out into open water, over to Santander, and then all the way along the coast down into Portugal. That was the aim. That wasn't to be because. Um, of Sir Francis Drake's greed. And because of his greed, there was a great deal of loss of life on the English side. Um, the strategic ob objective of the military campaign was to break Spain, was to break the embargo on the Portuguese world. Because, because Spain was now in control of the Portuguese empire for, for a while, uh, England couldn't trade with it. It needed those goods. And one of the goods it needed was the sugar. Um, so obviously sugar beet is, is obviously coming from Africa and elsewhere, so we, we, we're trying to break all that, you know, the Portuguese are in Africa and you've got the likes of, and, and so on. I mentioned the sugar because um, Queen Elizabeth lost her teeth because of the sugar. Oh, that's for you, Ellen. But anyway, um, jokes aside, what, what needed to happen was that the, they, they needed those trade links. They needed those trade links with India and China and Spain was stopping England. And also by securing an alliance with the Portuguese crown, Elizabeth hoped to curb the power of the Spanish in Europe, i.e. the Netherlands and um, Austria um, and the likes of Italy. And what was gonna happen is that they were gonna put a pretender on the throne, a certain um, Crato. Um, um, Crato was, was sort of aristocracy, Portuguese aristocracy. And he was gonna be placed on there as a puppet. And, we were gonna have a, this great allegiance with uh, Portugal and that was good, what was gonna happen, right? Break the power of the Spanish and that's what was gonna happen. But the complex politics um, started to go awry from very early on into the expedition. And it started off with the following. Here we go. The expedition was floated as a joint stock company. So in other words, money had to be raised, not from the crown only, had to be raised from um, the aristocracy. Um, and hopefully, if, if you get support from the aristocracy, um, they could sort of get a little bit of money on the side from 
you know, a few other things like raiding the Spanish um, treasure fleet as it came back from the New World. Uh, she sort of probably knew that, but, you know, that's what Sir Francis Drake's aim was. He would say to people, you know, put a few thousand pound in. Um, we can have a few more ships, you know, raise a, raise a big army. So what happened was that um, it's, it's quite, it doesn't sound a lot, but 80,000 pound had to be raised. So 80,000 um, pound is probably equivalent today of in the region of about um, um, 800 billion pounds. So this, this is the amount that needed to be raised. Um, so it's a quite a substantial amount of money. Um, one quarter was uh, offered by the Queen from taxes. She couldn't, she couldn't raise that much, but, you know, taxes. Um, and then the Dutch, they, the Queen said to the Dutch, she said, right, in, in, because we supported you in your rebellions against the Spanish, you give us one eighth. And then the remaining amount was actually to be raised by the noblemen. So obviously they needed a bit of a cut back on, they needed a return. This was a, this was a business venture, not just, um, not just a military adventure, there was business adventure as well. Uh, logistics were, um, the, the, the English fleet was sort of spread around a bit and concerns over logistics and adverse weather delayed the departure from Plymouth. Um, and confusion grew as it waited in port by the time the Dutch, by the time the Dutch got their act in order, they didn't really arrive with a massive fleet. There's just these flyboats, no real galleons. Um, the soldiers had eaten a third of their supplies in port. Well done. You know, you're going out to supply with ships that are not really laden with full supplies. Um, so a third of the, um, the food and drink was actually already used up before they actually sailed. Um, and then, the Queen Elizabeth said, oh, you know, we don't really need that many experienced soldiers against the Spanish. Chuck in around 1,800 experienced soldiers and we'll, so the, the rest can be conscripts. So here we go. So um, sailors, conscripts and 1,800 soldiers went on board these vessels. Um, and the same thing happened. What they wanted to do, they wanted to gather troops on the way. Um, they wanted to have another 10,000. It never happened. Exactly the same happened with the Spanish the year before. They did manage to get the soldiers from the Netherlands to invade. And this is, this is why, you know, when you think about the figures, the, the, the Spanish, you know, the figures are a lot less than they say in connection with the Spanish invasion the year earlier. Um, not 25, more like 20, so 15,000 losses. And the English army is the same. Um, and, and the Navy, 20,000 um, losses of 15,000. So there we go. So what's happening is the fleet sailed, as we know, six galleons, royal galleons, 60 armed English merchantmen, very large vessels, 60 flyboats and 20 pinnacles. In addition, um, in addition um, Drake decided to um, split the fleet into five parts. And being so, somebody like Keith, you don't split your military into um, units. You keep it all together. But Francis Drake thought he knew better. Um, one part of the fleet had the army led by Earl of Essex, uh, and there was a and there was Francis Drake on the vessel known as the Revenge, um, and there was another um, rather um, famous individual known as Sir John Norrie, and there's another Thomas Fenner on the Dreadnought. Um, so you know they they had um, five different individual fleets. Um, so and the other point to be made subtext is that Philip lost um, his lesser vessels in his return visit, not his large galleons, another myth put to rest. Um, and these galleons were locked in port in um, northern Spain to be refitted. With the unforeseen delays, here we go. I like my drawing. Um, so let's do a bit of drawing. Um, here we go. Thank you very much. Um, and here we go. So what happens is the Navy goes along the coast and decides to go this way. Oh, down, it, it misses Santander. Uh, can't make it up. It misses Santander because the, um, and because the winds are unfavorable. So it, instead of um, the fleet being pushed towards Santander, it's pushed off course. Um, and it heads all the way then all the way out to here. 
and what at the time at the same time um those 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 wait for it those four spanish galleons and those 15 spanish vessels are harrying uh, the fleet of 146 english and dutch vessels you know they're harrying them they're taunting them they're following them a tiny spanish fleet taunts this mighty mighty invincible the invincible english armada the invincible english armada it harries them it's almost as if sir francis drake is afraid of this tiny little fleet behind him anyway they end up in corinia um, and some of the uh, they go to the harbour at Corinna, La Corinna, um, because so Francis Drake believes that there's a large tower in Corinna, um, and this large tower in Corinna contains gold. It, it's it's like El, El Dorado. There's a tower. There's, it's full of gold. So Sir Francis Drake, instead of going on with his second objective, instead of destroying his, the instead of destroying the um, Spanish fleet here, now the second objective is to um, he believes what they're going to do they're going to invade from Spain and go all the way into Portugal. You know, they just don't tell Queen Elizabeth this is about gold. Right, just don't tell her. I, I can't make this up. This is true. Um, so what happens then is that the the Spanish what happens is that um, really behind them now um, a few a few of the Spanish vessels back off now and there's 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 two there's um, here we go one of the galleon the Spanish galleons uh, um, one of the Spanish uh, galleons with fifty cannons. And two galleys, the Diana and the Princess, of 20 cannons, and two um, other smaller ships with 20 cannons each, harry the 150 strong English fleet. Can you imagine just a small number of vessels harrying the English fleet? Um, and what then, what is then said is the other thing. The Spanish army, the Spanish army, here at Corinna is 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 a mighty 1500 strong and landing uh, with Essex Essex army is is around 10000 strong that's the uh, that's Essex's army that lands on the shore at Corinna 150 spanish versus 10000 um, english soldiers 150 ships on the English side facing um, a mere six Spanish fleet, uh, vessels out at sea. Remember, one galleon, two galleys, um, two smaller vessels, um, and another vessel to boot. So there's six. Um, and lo and behold, these, these 1,500 Spanish troops, 1,500, holds off the mighty force of 10,000 um english and dutch um, troops off for two weeks it holds them off um the english army is no match for the spanish it's it, it's and, and um it it captures the english army does capture the lower part of la Carina, but it's unable to capture the rest of it and the reason why it's unable to get capture the rest of it because the english army finds the wine cellars and the army gets drunk 10,000 soldiers getting drunk, and that's true. Uh, instead of capturing the upper town and the castle, the Spanish hold them back with severe losses. Thousands of English soldiers are lost. Now, there are more English soldiers lost in fighting at this stage than soldiers lost in action um, in the earlier Spanish Armada. This gives you the true gravity of the campaign. The two um, Spanish vessels, the Princess and Diana, whilst all this is going, keep breaking the embargo of 150 English vessels. They keep supplying La Coruña, the parts of La Coruña that are still held by the Spanish. After two weeks, 
the English army all jumps on its little vessels and runs away. And it decide, they decide that we failed on this, we, we failed on this occasion. And now what we're going to do, we're going to head down to Portugal. So, um, because the English army is afraid of the Spanish reinforcements. The Spanish send in a few reinforcements. But the English army, low on morale, many of them drunk, they abandon the siege and retreat to their ships. Um, and they've, at this point, they've already lost a number of their vessels. The Spanish have knocked out a number of their vessels out at sea. Um, it's likely at this stage they've already lost three of their galleons and a number of their vessels. This, this is how amazing um, the English Armada is. Uh, it's, it's said that, um, it, it's said that um, maybe, maybe, um, I don't know, I don't know what the figures are. It's, it's going back and forth, but there's, there's quite a few thousand English soldiers lost at this stage. At this point, um, some of the Dutch vessels um, head back um, all the way through to La Rochelle being harried by the very small Spanish fleet. More ships are lost, by the way. So at this stage, the next point is, is that um, then we then turn on to, um, so he's failed to destroy the Spanish fleet, Sir Francis Drake. Um, he's failed to capture La Coruña. There's no gold in the tower. So the next aim has to be to go to Portugal um, and raise a rebellion in Portugal with the, the men that he's got left. And the men that he's got left is, is um, well, there's a few less than before. The, fi the figures are really sketchy, but you know, we had a few thousand down before you even get to Portugal. So um, Elizabeth's plan was to stir up a Portuguese uprising against King Philip. So here's the map. So they've sailed um, along the coast from La Coruña out into sea. Um, they're going to land here. They're going to send the rest of the Navy into Lisbon. And hopefully there'll be a massive uprising. And suddenly Portugal will be in the hands of the English. That's, that's the theory. That is the theory. Um, so next. And it's hope it's hoping because the the um, what's happening is because the um, the illegitimate um, king of Portugal, a Crato, who's going to be the you know who's going to be the puppet king for Queen Elizabeth, he's actually um, heading the army in front of Essex as well. Um, so so all this all this is now we're into um, we're into May the sixth. So here we go into May the sixth. Um, Drake arrived at Paniche um, in Portugal, which was handed um, to them by supporters of Crato. So um, a little bit of success. Um, so here we go. Uh, that's the location we're going to go to next. I can't pronounce it. I haven't got Cathy to correct me. Um, they land at Paniche and what happens is that the, um, the Portuguese um, rally to the English and they say, right, you know, we want rid of the Spanish and um, the, the Portuguese traitors. However, at this point, at this point, um, able to fight, Sir Francis Drake from 20,000 only has 11,000 left who are able to fight. At this point, lots of them have disease. And guess how many ships were told are left? A few did return to La Rochelle, but the number of ships left at this point is 110 from a figure of 150. So at La, Ra La, La Coruña, there were 150 vessels. Now it's 110. At this stage, the, uh, the English Armada's already lost more vessels than the Spanish Armada had done the year before. And on that moment, uh, let's get some of the vitriol from you guys as I open the mics and we're gonna have a break. So let's open your mics um, and we're gonna cut the sharing.
funnily enough, you're all still with me. Um, so uh, let's unmute you all. Let's have your vitriol. Um, anyone would like to say anything at this stage? Um, I do believe you can speak because oh, I've... Hi, yeah. Yeah, what it is, if um, what you've been written in the um, Spanish annals of their marvelous victory against the British would be evidence. Of, of the, of the, right. Uh, actually, actually, at the end, at the end, this point is made. This point is made um, because because the British Empire. Right. Two two points. This actually comes at the end, but you're, you're curious about it now, so I will put it in there now. So. Um, after this victory, the, the, the um, Spanish are happy with the fact that they've, they've um, annihilated the English fleet. Um, they've destroyed the English Armada. Um, and they don't, they don't rub Queen Elizabeth's nose in it. That's it. But the English reaction is very different, as we've already said. However, when people are actually starting to make, um, you know, make the best of the British Empire, the British Empire is starting to become the British Empire... Um, with the union with Scotland in um, 1707, um, the British Empire starts to get really big by about 1800. And then, because the Spanish Empire is really starting to wane um, and it's starting to decay, most of the Spanish colonies are gone. Uh, the Spanish forget about its old victories and the English, the, the British, start to say how wonderful we are. We Ooh. defeated the Spanish world. We can defeat any empire. And in the writings of the Spanish, they don't really talk about this because they no longer have an empire. They don't have a great world to talk about. They may have had this great, these great victories early on. They may have defeated the English Navy over and over again, but they weren't prepared to write about it because now the British Empire was in the ascendancy. And most of the writing that we do find about these two events and the one event, the Spanish Armada, <laughs> is written by those in the 18 and the 1900s. Right, any other questions? Come on. There's usually more questions at this stage. Yeah, you know you said the Bay of Biscay was deep and had bad weather. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's shallow. <clears throat> it's part yeah. of the continental shelf. And because you've got the weather coming in from the west, from the Atlantic, in very deep water, all that force is then... I, I'm into ...shallow weather. So if you're out in bad weather sailing, it's absolutely horrendous. Actually, 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 I'm, actually I'm actually told that you've got the, the deep water in the heart of the Bay of Biscay by two sailors that we had this lecture on Tuesday. Oh. When you get, well, these are two sailors. And when you get terrible storms um, in the Off Bay of Biscay. Off he's waving at you. <laughs> when, you can get, when you can get terrible storms in the Bay of Biscay, um, you, you, can, you can lose all hands on, on well, no, this is what I'm told. I'm told by two experts, is what I'm told. <laughs> Gosh! There's a map where you've got the shallow water all around the community. That's, I, I showed you there was shallow water around the outside in the centre of the Bay of Biscay. It's deep. No, um, but you don't sail there. You sail around the coast. Oh! But it's not deep. Hey. Have a look at Ellen, 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 I, sh I, sh I showed you on the plan, if you were watching, that they went slightly out into deep water. That's what we were talking about. Goff, Goff. He's muted. He needs unmuting. Hang on, he's muted. Actually, it says that he's unmuted. Yeah, he's not muted. <laughs> muted on mine. He's, no, not, he's muted. not on mine. Are you... Are you... Right, okay, who else wants to say something? Where were the ships built? The English ones. Um, lots of these, lots of these ships are being built um, in the Low Countries because we've got great shipbuilding in the Netherlands, for example. Um, so obviously, obviously, we've got har we've got har we've got um, shipbuilding in Southampton, and we've got some shipbuilding on the Thames. Probably a bit of shipbuilding in Bristol. Um, we're not talking about the time of great shipbuilding in Scotland because there was no shipbuilding industry in Scotland. There was no shipbuilding in industry in Wales at the same time. Comparatively, it's either the low countries that we're getting a lot of these vessels um, or we're getting um, ports at Southampton and um, in the Thames that we've actually got the shipbuilding. Goff. Goff wants to say something, but we can't get it. I, I don't know what's wrong with wrong with his mic. Uh, Goff, are you are you muted on your on your laptop? He's muted his laptop. 
Oh, right. Okay. Um, anyone else want to say something else? Paper. <laughs> He has to write something. Yeah. Write it down. Hold it up to the camera, write it. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, actually, Goff's completely gone. No, yeah, I can see, see him. I can see him. Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah, see him. I just can't hear him. He's waving his hand in frustration. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, okay, okay, I, I can't, I can't, right. And, if, and he's the seaman, after all, he should be able to say a lot about this. Yeah. Right. I, I did actually show you a plan of the Bay of Biscay, and I said, I, I specifically said that there was sailing along the coast of France, and they had to go into deep water because they were blown out there by the winds. I said that. Um, right. Well, your arrows were in the wrong place, weren't they? It's <laughs> 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 Whatever you were seeing must have been very different from mine. Um, now, if nobody's got anything else to say, then um, uh, we will take a break. Can you okay. hear me? I, I just shall say goodbye as I can't, I can't return after the break. That was very interesting again. Um, oh, Carl, thank, 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 thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rosamond. Okay. I'll say bye all and hopefully bye. see you all next week. Bye. Yeah. See you next week. Bye. 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 Yes. Right. Somebody else. Thank you. Week. Thank you, see you, Rosamond. Somebody else wanted to say something else then. Go on then, quickly, and we'll have a break. Okay, not sugar beet, it's sugar cane they would have got from Africa. Uh, thanks for the correction, yeah, sugar cane. Sugar beet, yeah, sugar cane, yeah, yeah. I was, if, you, if you noticed, I was also trying to um, put a bit of light in there. Yeah, sugar cane, you are really right, yeah. Not sugar beet. Um, um, if nobody's got anything else to say, then we'll take a break. Okay. Bye, go. I mean, have a coffee. Poor old Goff. Goff, can you text me? Text me, Goff. Go on, text me. Goff is texting me. Um, and what, what I'm going to do, it, top, Goff is going to... Uh, right, here we go. Goff is texting me now. I do believe. Go on, Goff. Goff, why don't you just phone me? <laughs> God's sake. Oh, he's phoning me now. Oh, you oh. Hiya, Garth. Hiya. Are you there? Can you hear me, Garth? Yes, I'm here. Um, I'm, 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 honestly, I'm looking on my screen. Um, it's not saying anything. What I'm going to do is mute everybody, right? If I mute everybody, if I, right, what it says here, allow participants to unmute themselves. So if I unmute everybody, give it a go now. How's that? Yeah. Right, so you, can, was, you can now speak a golf. It was you, you plonker. <laughs> Stop trying to blame me for things I haven't done. Right, go for it. Um, you wanted to say something, go for it. Ellen's right about La Rochelle and La Carunia. No! Been, but, there, done that. But, Been sick. But, but those ships didn't have deep drafts. They were very shallow, so they could have navigated around there. Yeah, but the weather... Stormy weather makes it really choppy and horrible. Yes, I know. Right, okay, okay. Actually, actually what I'm showing on the screen, what I'm showing on the screen, I said... Exactly. Uh, yes, I, this is what, there in the centre of the Bay of Biscay, it's deep water, right? Now, yes. I... Sh Absolutely. Yes. Now, I, I, actually, I actually did this. The movements were along the coast. I said this, and then suddenly, as they're, as they're reaching... As they're reaching Santander, they're, they're rushed out to sea, which takes them into deep water. And then they go back out and they come into La Coruña. That's exactly what I said. That's right, Carl. Because they wouldn't have a battle in shallow water. It's too dangerous, especially because they couldn't navigate very well in those old ships. Exactly. And they were probably going into a headwind. I, I tell well, you what. I, well, I'll tell you what, Del, and you stick to dentistry and I'll stick to seamanship. Yeah, but the wind direction's coming from the west. Oh my god! 
You also agreed with me by saying when it's stormy, I, that's what I said. I, I can have a, I can have a drink. I, 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 do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to scream. Ah! No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go no. on. One more thing. You, you know, you're describing the vessels of that time. Yeah. If you want to see a good example of one of those, you can go to Bristol City Docks and see John Cabot's ship, the Matthew. Oh, nice. And that is a replica of his ship, which I think in the 1500s, wasn't it? And he went to Newfoundland. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, you uh, I, I, actually, actually, what we'll do, we'll get, we'll get an image of that one up. Okay, okay anyway, do you, do you know what, right? Um, I, 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 I prefer your seamanship. Yeah, there, there was another joke there about about um, Captain Pogwash and semen stains, but we won't go there. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, Cabot's, Cabot's, uh, Matthew, Bristol. Right, there we go. Um, and we'll we'll have a, we'll have an image of the vessel. Like, uh, yeah, that that's. Uh, do you know? Do you know what? Um, that that must uh, be that's so much. It. Can you, can you see can you see that image on there now? No. No. Who asked you? <laughs> you, know, do you, know, do you know. Do you know what I mean? I'm having a conversation with this young man here, and I got I mean a woman interfering with me. <laughs> you wish. <laughs> All right, then I wish. Um well, uh, get it up. Uh, I, I, oh God's sake, please stop this. Bloody innuendo! Right, okay, so um, I'm gonna get it up now. I've, I've been trying all my life to get it up. Technology's not working, mate. Yeah, I, I know. Do you, do you know, do you know my, my, my doctor did give me Viagra? Yeah. That's it. That, I'm not saying any more. Um, right, okay. Um, Oh God! Do you know? Do you know? You're a very naughty man. You are. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know. Uh, uh, you got a. Do you know what? Right. You got more women in your stable than on on bloody um. Shergar's bloody allotment. Do you know what I mean? It's just. Right. Here we go. Here's here's his vessel, and you can talk about this while I go and play with the traffic. There you go. That's it. Job done. <laughs> Are you seeing this? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You can Good. go on it. You can sail I, on it. Why? Why has it got a bloody Irish um, flag on the um on the aft? Last time I become a pig in the middle for anybody because I'm getting it in the neck. Oh, what are you doing? I, I've told Carol. If, if <laughs> Who, who's getting it in the neck? Right. There's a two I by the sounds. <laughs> there, look, there, there's two conversations going on here. They, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can have it in the neck with a gimp mask on. I'm just going to have a cup of tea, for God's sake. <laughs> oh, you're off. No, I'm not off. I'm going to Oh, okay. Oh, I can see you're in your new home now, Jim. Yeah, that's the new home now. Yeah. Behind me. <laughs> <laughs> our shed, our posh shed. <laughs> don't give up your day job. Yeah, don't give up the day job. Yeah. <laughs> Wherever you are, sit down, 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 get down, wherever you are, get down, 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 wherever you are, oi! Get a sea shanty. I dreaming of a white Christmas. <laughs> Do -do -do. Just like the bombs at Stalingrad. He's off again. <laughs> <laughs> He's off again. I know. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, dear me. Dear Spenny was singing about dreaming of a white Christmas. I went out for coffee yesterday with uh, Carol Ann. Oh, yeah, where? Uh, uh, Lucy used to have the Wine Street Cafe. She's mm -hmm. got a little mobile catering thing. And oh, she's yeah, one station. The station car park. Yeah, that's it. The, the, the train station car park. She's there every day till one o'clock. Oh, wow, that's um, nice. So, yeah, you have to stand and drink your coffee, you know. <laughs> oh, there are a couple of benches, you know, the, the ones yeah. that are up there anyway. But, uh, yes, yeah, so you might be lucky to be able to sit there, but otherwise you have to stand. But, you know, it's a little bit of normality. Um, and Caroline was on about, oh, what if we're still in lockdown by Christmas? How are we going to manage that then? You know? oh. <laughs> so she decided we should bring Christmas forward to August. You know, just so that oh. everybody could sit out in the garden at a safe social distance. You could have a wee <laughs> family round to have Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't go to have a coffee about two o'clock this afternoon because you'll see me nicking valerian from the station. <laughs> I've already done it. I did so <laughs> yesterday. I'm going to plant it out today. It? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it from the hedgerows. All, all the hedgerows along the main road have got loads of it growing. Yeah. Is yeah. there any left? Any left? Yeah, yeah. I, I only took a few bits. But oh, yeah. Okay. Great. It's really nice, isn't it? It is. Lovely colours. I like the look of that. I love it. Brilliant. Hmm? Hi, Andrew. Valerian. Valerian, yeah. What do you do with it? Just as flowers, is it? Mm. Well, you can take it for. Um, uh, which makes you, um, does it make you sleepy? Yeah. Yes, yes, we were saying that. It used to be a, a sleeping thing, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. There you go, we could go into narcotics production as well. Uh, <laughs> when yeah. I get my greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what a cannabis plant looks like. <laughs> you must be the only one. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be the smell coming from the greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> See, you've got to do something to pass the time during lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's into growing at the moment, didn't you know? I'll tell, tell, tell you what, it's like listening to a bunch of bloody old witches. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> there's, nothing, there's nothing witchy about me, I'm just an old witch. <laughs> oh, I think I've got some growing in my garden now, I'm looking at the pictures. Well, Danja? <laughs> no, Valerian. Oh, Valerian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is growing everywhere. It's it's really like in this weather. Yeah. <laughs> I don't seem to have everyone's pictures up. I don't know why. Oh, don't my, you, yeah, only comes oh. up when I talk. Yeah, it's, I usually well I have them all up in squares normally. Yeah. Have you got your grid I somewhere? It's, I think it's Carl's done something. Oh. I can see everyone. Jane's just gone off. Yeah. And Keith, oh, there's Keith. <laughs> Come back now. We're all back again. We're all back again. Yay! Oh, no, oh, there you go. Oh dear. James you. disappeared. Pam, <laughs> um, can we do a can we do a sound test for your voice, please? Hello. Testing, testing. One, two, three. I tell you, well, that's really sexy. You can join me for the second hour. <laughs> I'm going to join with there. <laughs> you, 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 I'm you, not. Oh, so Jim, right. What? Have you moved? Who? Jim, have you moved? Uh, almost. Got one weekend, two days to go before I fully oh. moved in. Oh. Just like oh. a the house behind you. I thought you'd moved. It looks like a right oh, mess. Well, we're going there back and forward at the moment. Oh, we're right. Uh, yeah. Do, you know, do you know anybody with a large van we could borrow? <laughs> <laughs> Have you bought your van yet, Carl, so I can borrow that? 
You can't use a bloody portable museum van for that. Flipping heck, that'd be, that'd be sacrilege. How, how, how would I explain that to Goth? There is hard earned money has been used in transporting your crap between Barry and Lantwick. Uh, bookcases, bookcases. Yeah, I'm seeing them here, haven't I? <laughs> There's a place called Wick Van Hire, Jim. No, that means oh, you've got to spend money. <laughs> you've got loads of them. <laughs> I've got to pay them, though. <laughs> yeah, well, that's his rule, isn't it? <laughs> so where's Ellen? Oh, hey, since 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 me and Goff sh um, had to go at Ellen, she seems to have disappeared. Let me have her on that broomstick in a minute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, act actually, because because Pam feels a bit sort of um, you know that she doesn't want to join me. A uh, uh, beautiful, sexy voice today. Um, Keith, I'm picking on you. Yeah. <laughs> you horrible man. Get your hair cut. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you've got a cheek. <laughs> right, let's, let's, get ready, let's get ready to start. Last biscuit. Good. Uh, there's a wicked witch. She's just about to join us. Right, okay, go for it. <laughs> Hi, Erin. Put my dinner on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyone else got anything else to say before me and Keith does the last bit? It's all rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> bit too many facts and figures for me. <laughs> I'm oh. starting to lose the plot. <laughs> yeah, I'm not thinking at all, Steph. <laughs> oh, flipping heck! Number of men who died and the number of ships and... Honestly, the remains. <laughs> My sources say only 65 of the Spanish ships returned. Oh. We lost almost half of their ships. Well, I don't know what source Francis Drake was just a typical product of his period, so he was the same as everybody else. Yeah, and he was actually asked by Elizabeth to go out and <laughs> yeah, he had be a, a pirate. <laughs> he had a, a, whatever they called it, a, a license to do it. Yes, that's it. <laughs> you got a license to kill. Right, okay. Oh, God. Go on, get on with it. Oh, do you just want me to do this by myself again? <laughs> <laughs> You're used to it. <laughs> I'm used to doing it solo, yeah, thanks a lot. Right, okay, we'll be back. Right, I'm going to put you all on mute. Right, here we go. Hang on, mute them all. I can't get them all bloody muted. Mute all. <laughs> right, okay, um, mute them all. And here we go, me and Keith. Me and Keith are going to have a moment. Oh, see, you know, Keith. Yes, my captain. And Capitan, oh, damn it, calling right. Okay. So, so it's just me and you, Keith, right? Lonely, okay. all all alone in a room. Okay. Um, and um, obviously, we we were at these we were at these fire ships last, right? And um, I tell I, I tell you what, they're going to love next week's lecture then. We got loads of debauchery and uh, pillaging next week. I, I tell you what, those wicked old witches like Chris and Ellen, I tell you, oh, oh, and that cackling Karen, you, you, you can't believe it some weeks. Um, anyway, so. It's the lock in, that's what's done it. The, the, I, I, I bloody lock them out. So, right, here we go next. So, we've been to Corunya. Um, and that was that was rather fruitless. Um, and next, we need to go further on down the coast to Lisbon. So we need to go to Lisbon. So rather interestingly, before the break, um, our wonderful learned gentleman that agrees with me that you've got deep water in the centre of the Bay of Biscay, and if you sail across it, you're going to uh, really do damage to your vessels. Um, he told me to look at this. This is um, John Cabot's um, vessel that he took over to find a Newfoundland. But this is obviously a much earlier vessel, and it's, but it gives you an idea of the two castles on the prow and, prow and the after the vessel. So um, next we want to go to, um, if we want to bring in the map, uh, there's that legendary map. Doesn't, doesn't she so love that map? 
So we have already ended up in Portugal. And before we actually get to Portugal, um, these, these are one of the elite of the Spanish army of the time. Um, uh, he, he look, he looks, a Nancy boy. Actually, actually, you are the second person that actually say that. <laughs> but this is one of your, the elite Spanish fighting men um, of the day. So probably an officer in the army back in the day. So, um, so what's happening is that when we head towards, um, trying to get myself back into it, there, there's Sir Francis Drake a minute. So the next plate was going to go to, but this is Sir Francis Drake. Um, for some reason, I'm actually struggling to get into this. So what we mentioned is that um, we had already got the um, the English army to Peniche. Um, and what's going to happen um, is that now heading towards Lisbon um, is going to be 11,000 men on the side of the English with, at this point, 110 ships. So these have got to sail on down the coast. Um, they wanted to um, make a land attack um, from Peniche all the way over to Lisbon, but they decided that wouldn't be practical. So they decided to get all the, all the troops and everything on board um, the vessels down to Lisbon, um, where they would be facing 7,000 Portuguese and Spanish soldiers. And, and it's at this stage now 40 ships some of the line of the Portuguese and Spanish fleet. So instead of the six that they were facing earlier on, these 110 ships are now going to be facing 40 ships. Lisbon was rumoured to be uh, guarded by a dissatisfied, uh, dis, um, um, disaffected a garrison. It was supposed to be guarded by a garrison that would just surrender to the English and they didn't need to uh, besiege Lisbon. Uh, but unfortunately, this wasn't to be the case. The first blow that day, however, was on the side of the English. When they actually landed at Lisbon, they managed to capture the um, Lisbon um, granaries. So um, it, was, it was thought at that stage that this could be a revival of the English Navy and the English Army's fortunes. Um, this is Sir Francis Drake with a, a nice smug smile on his face from the year later. Um, and Essex, who's leader of Sir Francis Drake's land army, is said to have um, gone to the gates of Lisbon after taking the um, granaries. And it's, it's said that he thrust his sword into the gates of the city. And he's saying, defenders, come out and fight. We are the English and we want to fight you. But he basically wanted to do that. Um, because he didn't have any cannon. He didn't have any artillery to besiege the city. Um, he, he didn't, the, the cannon were on board the vessels to ward off the Spanish, and he didn't have any artillery to um, take the city. So in other words, they couldn't damage the walls. Um, he was relying upon um, an, a land force joining him at Lisbon, which never arrived. Uh, Essex, on the other hand, after this great panache, um, going deep into May, Essex received orders from Queen Elizabeth, and the orders were to return to court, along with a refusal to send reinforcements. She had heard that things didn't go well at Santander. In other words, the first aim um, wasn't completed. They didn't manage to destroy the Spanish fleet. Um, then she heard about La Coruña. Um, the siege at uh, La Coruña failed. Um, and now she's told that things were not going right at Lisbon. Um, so for San Sir Francis Drake basically turned around and said to Essex, you know, what we've got to do, we've got to get, get the army um, on board the vessels, right? And we've got to take the army to the Azores. So this is, this is, the, this is the command that Francis Drake gives to Essex. Um, so going all the way from Lisbon, uh, we're gonna we're gonna get um, we're gonna get every everybody together, and we're gonna try and capture the Azores. However, the tragedy at this stage is that out of eleven thousand men that may have landed at Lisbon that day, only two thousand, after a couple of weeks, were actually um, fit to fight. Two thousand. So you're talking about the navy. 
20,000 the army, um, the sailors on board the vessels, they're, they're still um, up and about, but they've only got a force of about 2,000. And um, so Francis Drake is saying, right, what we're going to do, um, if, if, we, if we secretly sail to the Azores, um, we, can, we can catch the, um, we can catch the Spanish off guard and we can capture the Azores. So they marshaled everybody back into their vessels. Um, and then what happened was that the Spanish Navy engaged. And when the Spanish Navy engaged, um, it knocked out one of the um, flagships of Sir Francis Drake's fleet, the William, which was being fought off by the Revenge. Um, so where the Azores are, that nobody actually, um, that we went, there's the Azores, out in the Azores. Um, just, to, just to wind Ellen up, let's just do a bit of uh, Ellen, just wind Ellen up. Um, um, so, uh, so here we go. As they're, nice, as, they're, yeah. as they're sailing out to the Azores, um, they're hit by a Spanish fleet on both sides. Um, and the problem is now is with the attack on the Azores becoming out of the question, Drake made a final attempt to retrieve the mission. So he had failed to invade Portugal and, and raise a rebellion. Um, he had failed to capture La Coruña. He'd failed to destroy the ships at Santander. Um, he'd failed to capture the Azores. Um, and it said, at this point, a storm whipped up in deep water. Um, and it's said at this point, many of the, the ships were either damaged, destroyed, um, sunk, um, unfit to sail. He had only 2,000 men available to fight. Um, and it was said at this stage that Drake um, took his pick of what was left of the Navy that he had left. And it, there were 20 ships fit um, for action. And um, these 20 ships fit for action would hunt for the Spanish um, treasure fleet while lying in wait uh, for it, his naval force was struck by another heavy storm. Um, and it is very likely then that with this heavy storm, um, the, 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 the English Navy and the army decided to head back to, um, head back to um, Portugal. But unfortunately, they got lost on the way. Uh, these sailors actually got lost on the way and they actually ended up going to Madeira um, and they thought Madeira was actually Portugal and they were um, and they were actually sacking uh, Porto Santo in Madeira uh, in realizing it wasn't uh, Portugal they actually thought oh my god we're actually completely lost so uh, this was this was in fact the end of the campaign but it wasn't um, it wasn't the end of the campaign yet because the fleet needed to get back. Um, so I've got another figure here. The English fleet lost um, about 58 vessels, not 40 vessels, not 50 vessels, about 58 uh, vessels, which is considerably more than the Spanish fleet the year earlier, where some academics say they only lost 28 fleets in the Spanish Armada. Um, and the rather interesting thing about this is as follows. Facts, more facts for you, Chris. Uh, so out of the 58 vessels, 14 ships were lost directly to Spanish naval actions um, in four separate naval actions um, that they held against the Spanish. And in those four naval actions, the Spanish won all four of them, which is highly unusual when we talk about the English Navy, um, that they lost all four naval actions. There were, no, there were no real naval actions in regards to um, this campaign um, to do with the Spanish Armada the year earlier. You're talking about the Solent and some ships, Spanish ships, sailed around the Solent and met the fleet and they were harried from behind by the English fleet. But, fleet, but ship on ship, it, we, we don't have many reports. We don't have many reports of a major naval action at the time of the Spanish Armada anyway. Um, and the rest of the ships were lost to Stormy Sea uh, or, or were lost to um, various other actions to do with the landings and so on. So that's 58 ships lost altogether. 
Now, the, the, the tragedy is, is as, as I already said, um, as I said, is as the fleet is now returning back, um, whatever's left of the fleet. So we're talking about, um, we're talking about under 100 vessels um, returning. So obviously, just, just for Ellen, uh, let's just do a whip straight across the, um, the, the sea here. Um, and um, I'm not really sure that that's what they did. And they ended up heading towards um, wonderful Plymouth, which is up there. Um, and in, in sailing into Plymouth, the, uh, the next part of the disaster uh, was the outbreak of disease on board the vessel was, was also transmitted to the port population in England on its return and thousands died then. So out of the civilian population, thousands died within the civilian population. None of the campaign's aims had been accomplished and for a number of years it's, this expedition's results discouraged further joint stock adventures on such a scale. So in other words, the, the English army one, were not prepared to go battling against the Spanish or the Portuguese for some time. The English expeditionary force had sustained a, a heavy loss of ships, troops and resources. Um, and strangely enough, um, this is a very strange figure. If you want to talk about some light in this, they managed to bring back £30,000 worth of plunder, but this was actually from Madeira. Um, and a little bit from La Coruña and Peniche and a little bit from Lisbon. But 30,000, the, the total cost of the fleet was 80,000. So you're talking about a bit of a loss. Um, and had not inflicted any damage, uh, a decisive, um, any decisive damage on the Navy or the um, Spanish um, army. So what I'd like to do is I'd actually like to read out a final statement, but we'll look at a few more images. Um, but before we actually look at those images, with the op opportunity to strike a decisive blow against the weakened um, Spanish Navy uh, lost, the failure of the expedition depleted the financial resources of the English, England's treasury, which had been carefully restored during the long reign of Elizabeth, thanks to her father, um, Henry VIII, um, with the dissolution of the monasteries. All that money was now gone. So we were uh, a great deal poorer for, the, for it. Um, I can't deny there were two other um, further Spanish armadas, um, but they were um, they were a bit more pensive. They they weren't really massively serious um, um, Spanish armadas against the English. They were just to sort of sail up and down the the um, um, English Channel to so to show look, we've still got a navy. You've lost many of your ships, um, and the interesting thing about um, about building the vessels, there was no money to uh, replace these vessels. There wasn't any money to replace these vessels. So, you know, the, the, the Spanish Navy is um, reinvigorated, uh, but the English Navy isn't. Um, so the statement I'd like to read at the end is, is, rather, um, is rather conclusive. And hopefully there's not many facts and figures in that. Sorry, Chris. Um, and this is the revenge in 1591 going down in another action against the Spanish Navy in 1591, two years later. It's almost as if the, the Spanish Navy are the ones out at sea. These are the ones who are performing great feats and victories out at sea. They, they're dominant at this stage. Um, Porto Santo, we've done that. And there is good old Queen Elizabeth. So before, before we actually go on to the last bit, um, what are your comments um, of this disaster before I do the last um, rounding statement? What would you say, Keith? Have I been fair? And I, I mean, by, I mean, I'm seriously now. Uh, slightly biased, I would say, but uh, I mean, you can only go by the facts that are available, can't you? And whatever sources are there to be read. So, uh, you know, you, you pick up two different books and they both give different opinions on things. So, exactly. You know, I, um, Obviously, there's a lot more written about the Spanish Armada than there is about the English Armada, so there's a lot more information available on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I agree. So um, I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to get something up on my screen. I would add that you know, at the time, Spain, Spain was obviously a, a lot more powerful country than uh, Britain was. Yes. You know, they were getting a lot of power in Europe at the time, and I would. Uh, um, you know, their empire was vast. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, it, it was vast and, and people, people have a tendency um, to forget that. They, they have a tendency to 
um, lose the small prints. And, and down from my high horse, um, um, Keith, uh, I would say, obviously, um, apologies for the tone today, but what I, what I really wanted to do, I, I wanted to express, um, I wanted to express something that has been missing from, from, from people's mindsets. And I, and I think this, this is one of the things that I be, want to try and do over the next few, few weeks. Um, so I've got, I've got this closing statement. It's, it's actually, um, from an academic archeologist point of view, uh, which is, which is the same point of view that, that I'm taking really. Um, and, and here we go. The English Armada was England's counter offensive. Um, the size of it, of it is striking given England's limited resources at the time. Now, um, in that Queen Elizabeth was able to put this navy together, it, it was an amazing feat. Um, you know, it, it, it was something amazing that, that these ships uh, were able to get together in, in one fleet um, not long after the Spanish Armada, because we did actually lose ships ourselves. Um, and that's, that's another thing lost um, when we look about the Spanish Armada. Um, and obviously those ships lost were actually those fire ships that were sent in, in amongst the Spanish Armada. Um, but Elizabeth was aware that it offered a unique opportunity. Um, in order to take advantage of it, she put the crown, um, the crown, a crown on, on, on it, on, on the line. You know, she, she, she got the taxes, she got the, what was available. And she said, use some of the money, but the rest is after going to have to be raised. The strategy was quite clear. Exploit to the full Philip's temporary weakness. Um, given that, um, 28 ships had been uh, shipwrecked off the coast of Scotland and Ireland on the Armada's uh, return journey. Now, this is written by an academic that's thoroughly researched this. He says only 28 ships were lost. Now, when he says 28 ships, um, and he's talking about Scotland and Ireland, he might be missing the few that were lost um, heading um, from um, the English Channel all the way up north. But, you know... That, yeah. that, that adds just about another five. What I heard ago. was that we knew the names of 28 ships, but uh, another 30 odd ships were lost and, and their wrecks have never been found. That's why they don't appear on the maps. So various, di various different figures there. So in addition, most, most, of the, um, most of the ships that returned needed a complete overhaul. Um, so we've got, we've, got names, we've got names of 102 ships that are returned, 28 that went missing. Um, so that leaves a few in my mathematics um, that are unaccounted for. But obviously, you know, what we've got to do is we've got to level this out and we've got to say, actually, both of these are absolutely complete disasters. The English Armada is a complete disaster and the Spanish Armada is a complete disaster. That's to level what I'm doing. And the loss of life is equal. The loss of ships is, is, is not comparatively equal. It's equal. Um, but the way it's treated um, after is, is another point of view. Hence, Spain was left comparatively defenseless if faced with a large-scale attack because it was repairing a number of its ships in the northern ports. So Elizabeth assembled a fleet, as we know, um, the biggest fleet ever put together by England at that stage. It was 150 vessels is a, is a, is a huge fleet. The mission had three objectives that we already mentioned. We mentioned a number of times. Um, and it was that pretension that um, they would capture um, the, um, the treasure laden fleet coming back um, from Central America through to the Azores. The English Armada failed, but the treatment that its failure received was from the outset totally different. Neither country viewed the defeat of the other as one of the greatest triumphs in its history back in the day. No one went from terror to euphoria because in 1589, Spain was suffering from grief and frustration. So, you know, they, they had lost many sailors. They had, they had, they had lost many fathers and sons. Uh, okay, they just defeated the English, but, you know, so what? You know, our loss is far greater than theirs. Uh, at that time, there was no prominence given to the Spanish victory in Coruña, uh, the first port attack by the English Armada. And... Um, um, it is true that the English had been mercilessly driven out and had suffered thousands of casualties, um, both dead and wounded. But once they had left, 
All that could be seen was that the lower part of the small city was nothing more than the smoke in ruin and the population had endured great suffering. So what the Spanish were interested in was the suffering of their people, not the victory itself, which is a different mindset than the mindset that the English may have had at the time. Victory in Lisbon was merely a great city's resistance to a brief attempted siege with a besieged army later repelling the attack themselves and forcing them to take to their ships again with considerable losses. The victories at sea were brilliant and particularly humiliating and damaging for an English armada routed and in retreat. So, you know, these are great naval victories, but then again, they're lost because um, if, you ever, if you ever look at a book about British naval histories, you won't, uh, British naval victories and British naval defeats, you won't see this in it. It's um, the British um, won every single naval, naval victory at sea in history. This is what you usually see in these books. I've read a book like that and it's very frustrating. Um, but they were, but in many ways to the Spanish, these were, can you hear me, Keith? Yeah, yeah, that's, right. no problem. In many ways um, to the Spanish, um, these were, these were just minor victories. You know, they, they, they need, they had to run their country. You know, they, they had to, keep their country growing. Um, Philip's, Philip vigorously re-engaged in war and strengthened his navy, however, so that it reached an unprecedented level of power. So due to the um, defeat of the Spanish Armada and the victory of the, um, in, over the English Armada, um, what the Spanish do as a result is not sort of celebrate or you know, mourn what's happening, is they, they go on to um, you know, have more naval victories and more land victories this is this is what happens um all he encountered um all drake encountered on the other hand was defeat and death from that moment onwards drake almost seemingly a national hero is is going on from um defeat after defeat but he, in the propaganda campaigns he's a national hero he's an absolute national hero um in order to spare um Drake and his commander Norris and Essex from the wrath of the Queen over their responsibility for the English Armada's defeat. The, there was a huge propaganda campaign was undertaken, which was almost as significant as the earlier one. Um, and this is the point. Um, the propaganda campaign earlier was basically saying, look how wonderful we are. It didn't talk about the disease and stuff. It didn't talk about the loss of English ships and so on in the Spanish Armada side. So when it gets to the English Armada, and when it gets to the English Armada, the Spanish, the, the English are actually saying, actually, we won this. Uh, does that sound familiar when you think about Waterloo, Keith? <laughs> yeah, it's always the way, isn't it? Normally, the victors write the history, don't they, as we've said before. So if you wanted to cover up a defeat, then that's what you'd do. Uh, yeah, they, they, but the French, the, the, this is the thing, that even though the French weren't the victors, and they still say they won it, but, you know. Well, yeah, 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 quite, quite. That's, that's um, the way they want to show it. Exactly. So, um, but when we look at this, is this is a similar thing, but it's more acute because Britain goes on to be in this great nation, as I mentioned to Jim earlier on. If in the if in the first case the aim was to talk up and idealise the success, this time it was in order to conceal a failure. Um, lots of pamphlets were being published, small pamphlets, large pamphlet, pamphlet, uh, pamphlets. One such writing by an Anthony uh, Wigfield, a contemporary of. Um, William Shakespeare um, created a new alternative reality by replacing the military operations with a story um, that was frequently um, invented with brilliance. So in other words, um, you know, we, we came back with a bit of money. Um, we, we get to the Azores, we got to Madeira, we, we went to Spain and Portugal, we come back. It was a victory. Um, for the last four... Nice. Go on, Keith. The nice summer holiday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we all wish we could go on it now. Exactly, exactly. For the last four centuries, this piece of writing has been the mainstream source um, used to reconstruct the fate of the English Armada. Other pamphlets were published in English for domesticated consumption and in Latin. Added to this was the typical um, character of English documents. Um, in, in contrast, um, the, the typical character was, you know, the, the likes of William Shakespeare, you know, the, the play-like nature of our writing, but in, in, when it comes to Philip, okay, we've defeated the English Armada, but what we need to do is move on. We need to sort out what's going on in Spain. We need to make sure that um, there's nobody else like Francis Drake nicking our 
treasure ships, you know, we, we've got to do something different. Sorry. And so the English Armada has grad gradually disappeared from the collective memory until it evaporated. It did not even turn into a myth. This asymmetry contributed in turn to the distortion of history. The reason for this distortion are complex and multiple, and I've passed through the centuries to the present day. It is no coincidence that historiography, um, which is not a word you hear often, historiography, on this subject was written and published in the 1800s and the 1900s, a period when um, Spain ceased to carry any weight in the international order of things, as it fell behind materi materially and intellectually only to become mired in inter internal wrangles. So in other words, nobody was commissioning anybody to write about the English Armada on the Spanish point of view. It was always, you know, the English were saying, look at this great victory that we had over the Spanish. And that's because there was money, that's because there was publishers able to publish it. But Spain at this point, when things were being written out and published, nobody wanted to write about it. it, it Spain was falling into a quagmire you know, what were they going to say? We were once a great nation and now look at us. They're not going to do that, are they? This was precisely the period when Great Britain reached its peak and sought out myths from the past in order to create its identity. You know, when we looked at Varus and we looked at um, Arminius and the legend of Hermann to reinvent Germany and all around this sort of um, Teutonburg forest, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot to do with that as well um, in, in a German point of view. And finally, to summarize, the English Armada is a systematic, um, is a systematic um, way of, as it's told, a, a way of rewriting history. Um, you, have to, you have to consider when you look at the whole story that I've told you, um, what are the myths and legends? You know, where is the balance? Um, you've also got to... Um, you got to look at new accounts um, for the first time um, and you've got to really look at the day-to-day -day nature of the Spanish and the English Armada because there's so much about the Spanish Armada that we don't know about either. You know, we don't really, you know, I can't say that, that um, you can pick up a history book and know everything about the Spanish Armada. So things, you need to re-look at all these different bits of history. Um, and then you need to go on and think about the aftermath and, and why things are hidden and, and, and why, um, why we hide things in history and, and why this is done. And, and what I wanted to do today was to, to, be, to be sound slightly biased and to get the anger out there and vent it and to actually say, you know, there's another history, there's, there's other events out there. And one event that we will be looking at in the near future um, is the story of Darien. Darien was an expedition of the Scottish to Central America to establish a colony. And because the Darien expedition failed in the late 1890s, it led to um, um, Scottish unification with the English because um, Scotland had no money left because it put all its money into this um, establishing a colony in Central America for Scotland. And that's a really interesting story. And that's a story that's yeah. not told a great deal. And we will do that in the near future. I've heard of that. Yeah, Darien. Yeah. And, and the, the wonderful story about Darien, Keith, is that um, when I saw a television program about Darien years ago, uh, the archaeologist involved in the work at Darien about 2006 was a guy by the name of Professor Mark Horton. Um, so I wrote to him and I, and I said, look, you know, I'm really interested in this. And... Um, and he wrote back to me and um, ever since I've, I've sort of been in touch with him now and again. He's a guy, he was actually one of the presenters in Time Team as well. Right. So and, um, Keith, um, now, now I've done my lecture today, before we open up the mics, is there anything that you would like to say um, to w wind up from your end? No, I don't think so, really. I, I mean, I think the British naval uh, supremacy only really started in about the... 1700s or late 1700s probably yes. up until that the British Navy had never been that good you know in the late 1600s we were beaten by the blinking Dutch so <laughs> you know, I, I, how do you say yeah I, I was doing the research on that um, there were there were four Dutch wars I think there was five actually and in two of those Dutch wars the Dutch were completely victorious over the English Navy and you're thinking right That's okay right. Yeah, they said they sailed up the Thames and they destroyed all that fleet at its uh, when it was at harbour and everything. So you know, navy was never good really until the 1700s. 
And what, what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to do is basically say, look, you know, we've we've got this we've got this wealth of history, but so much is missing. And then you can, with all the other bits, really understand what history is about. Yeah. So, everybody everybody who writes history has an axe to grind. Yes. You know, they want to put forward their own views and that's it. So it's always a matter it's just stimulating, shall we say. Exactly, exactly. Anyway, thanks thanks for joining us, Keith. And what we're gonna do now <laughs> Um, I, I would um, like to know if we're going to unmute everybody. All participants are now unmuted. Um, Ellen, uh, other than the Bay of Biscay, is there anything you wanted to say? Um, no. Okay, what about you, Karen? No, that was really interesting. I knew about the Spanish Armada, you know, the fact that it was all a myth, that the British defeated them, that it was all shipwrecks. Um, because that Lucy Worsley, where she does the, you know, debunking myths of history. Good old Lucy. She's done a programme on that. That was good, I didn't yeah. know about the subsequent English Armada disaster. No, so that was really interesting. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that. Um, what about, well, Keith, um, did you find that interesting today? Who, me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's all, all grist to the mill, isn't it? Good, good, good. Thank you for that. And what about you, Chris? Anything you want to say? Have they um, found any artefacts associated, any at all, or you know, with um, nothing, no, no wrecks, nothing? No, I think I think what it is when you think about um, okay, them and us. I think when we look, we look at the sea in a different way than a Spaniard, for example, and somebody from Portugal. So obviously, we always think about the sea. You know, we're on an island, we're always threatened by it. We've got to be very careful of it. You know, we're always collecting stuff from beaches and stuff. Um, but when you think about, I, I've, I've got a, one of the members from the um, Ronde class, he, he, lived, he lives partly in France. And he said in France, they've got a completely different um, perspective when you look at the sea in France. Um, in, in France, are they looking for artifacts from from shipwrecks like us um i think not and then you look at the spanish and the portuguese do you do you get spaniards and portuguese looking for um english doubloons for example are they, are they thinking the same as us and i and i think the answer is no um and that's the answer they're they're not there's obviously and the other thing as well is the the other answer is on the english wrecks it's likely that there's not that as much money on them as there would be associated with the Spanish wrecks on the Irish coast. So I wasn't thinking in terms of money, but you know, in terms artifactory, of artifactory ships, artifact, no. it, yeah, nothing, yeah. nothing that I'm aware of. Obviously, it's out there, but um, Spain has suffered from lots of other things that we haven't suffered from. I, um, when you look at La Coruña, that would have been affected by the civil war. So any archaeology is going to be badly damaged. Um, so there's the answers that the answers is I struggled and I really couldn't find anything. Um, Jim. Yes, um, I think the Spanish have got their revenge <laughs> by taking over Abbey National and the Alliance. <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, and, and Santander, that's why they said it. We, you, you, didn't just, San, you didn't destroy our fleet, Santander. What about you, Janie? No, nothing to ask or add. Good, good. Um, what about you, Goff? Yeah, great. Uh, very interesting. Different perspective on history. We all know the power of propaganda, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, and, and Sue, what about you? You're not there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Bloody muted. Hang on a minute. Hang on. <laughs> What did I do? I muted everybody earlier on and then I allowed everybody to unmute themselves and then if I unmute everybody, then she can talk. Now, Sue, unmute yourself. What? I don't know what the bloody do. What do I do? If, if, if Goff can work it out, an intelligent, good-looking woman like you can do it. Um, Pam, anything you want to say before I go? Yeah. Um... I sort of made notes as I went along and I sort of went on a journey because you mentioned Kent and I thought I know something happened at Lower Hellstone um, yeah. and then my mind wandered a little bit more and then I know Henry VIII sailed up the River Med Medway to Rochester so there am I I'm doing a journey alongside you 
No, um, that, no, that's good. That's helpful because obviously it's not a lots of the vessels that you're, you know, lots of those types of vessels are the, still, still the same vessels um, that are being used at the time of, of Elizabeth I. It's, it's not, it's not long after the, it's not long after the Mary Rose, to be honest with you. It's only, it's only 40 odd years after the sinking of the Mary Rose and was in, in 1546. So some of these vessels could still be at sea, yeah. Um, uh, and also, BP's were lit and it's still celebrated along the coast. And I don't know if that's connected. Yes, it is. Now, now that is the other point as well. This, this, this is a key point. Um, that, yeah, we talked about written history. Um, we still celebrate the Spanish Armada, right? For whatever reasons. Um, the Spanish don't celebrate the English Armada at all. Um, at all. There's nothing. And it's just thinking... It's a completely different mindset. It, it, it's a, I, wor I worked in Spain um, on, on an archaeological site and, and the mindset towards the archaeology is completely different from ours. It's far away from battle and fighting. It's more about the actual people. Um, it's, it's, more about, it's more about the loss of life. You know, I, I, tried, I tried to put some tender notes in there. It was a, it was a shame that... You know, so many soldiers died from disease on the English side. It was the same they got to Plymouth. I tried to do that, but, but I, I was tainted by, by what I was trying to say at the same time. So, uh, okay, if, um, um, I, go on, Pam, one more, one more, go on. House, one more, that's it. There is the house on the Quantocks, and I can't remember the name of it, but they do have connections to Sir Francis Drake. But saying that, I can't remember the name of it. So it's just to be side, really. Well, and the other thing as well is that about that, if, if it is his family home or something like that, um, it would be a completely different history painted there than, um, than I'm painting about mm, Francis I think Drake. it was the liaison of some sort. Okay, okay. So, a romantic liaison. Like, yeah. he, like he did with many, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay um hopefully i'll be uh, join, having you all join me next week next week is going to be a roman extra extravaganza we're gonna but it's also going to be um the destruction of the roman world um and we will and you will you will hear me say several times next week the only the only ones that can destroy rome is rome itself and you'll see that being said next week several times. That's a clue to where we're going to do. We're going to look, look at Honorius 410. We're going to look at um, Bird Oswald on Hadrian's Wall. We're going to look at um, Rome itself. We're going to look at 476 and that's part one. So if um, I don't know who's ringing the bell, anyone wants to chat afterwards, they may. Uh, if there's no more questions, okay. Um, no, no, all done. Uh, what I'm going to do is say good night to you all. I'll see whoever on Saturday for Abathor, I'll see you whoever next Wednesday for the forum. And, and, um, and um, obviously in the evening, Ellen's meant to be joining us in the evening for the classes, but she never does. Um, I'll see you all soon. I'll give you all a call on Monday. Thank you very much, okay. folks. Good night, Good Ellen, night. Keith, Jane. Bye, bye, thank you. Bye, 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 <laughs> good afternoon, Carl. Good, good goodbye. Well. Bye. What, what, what's, what's that, Pam? Good afternoon, not good night. Can you oh, say that in Welsh? Prin, prin haun dda. That's it. Okay, thank you. Prin, prin haun dda cariad. Um, dim, dim, prob, dim problem I gai de chi. Um, <laughs> dai am. I started you off there. Yes, you have. <laughs> Diolch yn chi, Pam. Ble mae nawr un y Bulgaria um, posib? Posib iawn, ie? Da iawn. Posib o, ie. Ie, ie, ie. Diolch. Diolch. See you soon. See you, see you, Pam. Bye, Dave. See you, Keithy, babes. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. That was a very...